Uh, today we're talking about the existence of God, part one. Actually, in the William Lane Craig book, there are two chapters, Existence of God 1 and 2, which is partly where I got the idea to do this, although I am not following exactly on William Lane Craig's breakdown in terms of what he does in 1 and 2, but there is a lot of material here um, to, for us to talk about. And in fact, whenever you start talking about these issues, one of the names that comes up most commonly today is William Lane Craig, the author of that book, which is one reason I had you uh, purchase this book as part of your, as one of the three books required for this class, because William Lane Craig is one of the most important and the deepest and most significant of the philosophical Christian thinkers today, um, dealing with philosophy and logic as an approach to the Christian faith, probably he and Alvin Plantinga are the two that are most significant. Uh, Plantinga probably carries even more weight. He almost individually reinvented natural theology for modern times. But uh, Craig, while a lot of people disagree with Craig, he is one that they have to respond to because he is very, very well known. So today we're looking at the existence of God. Next week, the existence of God too. Then creation, prophecy, and miracles, the risen Christ, responding to the arguments and applying the principles. As I've said before, uh, I, I reserve the right to make changes in this as I go along. I always do the first time I teach a course, but this is where I think we're going right now. Um, I want to start out with the statement that I used the first week. What apologetics cannot do. Uh, apologetics, the, the use of natural theology, philosophy, and, uh, and theology to argue for the truth of the Christian faith. Now, we're assuming there is Christian apologetics, there is Islamic apologetics, there's other kinds of apologetics. But one of the first things we have to recognize that apologetics cannot do is they cannot prove that God exists. In fact, it's very hard to prove beyond any doubt almost anything. Um, we can pre prove beyond a reasonable doubt, which is all that most people and the judicial systems and everything else require is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We cannot absolutely prove the existence of God, but I believe that uh, using the disciplines of philosophy, natural theology, and theology, we can logically argue for a reasonable acceptance of the existence of God. The other things that we've talked about, uh, apologetics cannot prove beyond any possible doubt that Christianity and the Bible are true. I believe they can prove or demonstrate that beyond any reasonable doubt. We cannot argue people into the kingdom of heaven. We cannot take the place of the testimony of scripture or the work of the Holy Spirit. We cannot exclusively replace biblical relational evangelism and discipleship. You can't simply argue with people in this stuff and get very far unless the Holy Spirit's involved and speaking to them. Um, and you don't replace relational kinds of uh, approaches to evangelism and communication. This can't be done by logical arguments via email. If you really think you're going to make a difference people's lives. So we need to be clear what apologetics can't do, and that's probably more critical today than on any of the other topics we're going to talk about, because today we are going to do more philosophy, more logical arguing than in most of the other classes. Uh, so we're, we're talking today about primarily philosophical apologetics, which concerns itself primarily with the arguments for the existence of God. Conversely, Whenever you start talking about apologetic arguments for the existence of God, you almost always rely heavily on, or, or almost exclusively, on philosophical apologetics, which is one of the types of apologetics that we discussed earlier in this class. Uh, if you don't remember that, you can go back and review the notes. There's a number of different approaches, and this is all of them, to the arguments for the existence of God. They include, and we're going to deal with several of these this week and some next week, the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, the Kalem cosmological argument, which is a very specific kind of uh, type or subset or reformulation of the cosmological argument, the teleological <coughs> argument, the fine-tuning teleological argument, again, sort of a modern science-based tele teleological argument, moral argument, transcendental, transcendental argument, presuppositional arguments, and then we probably, uh, we're going to do moral, transcendental, and presuppositional next week, for sure, but we may today get into Alvin Plantinga's argument that belief in God is properly basic, or what's called Reformed Epistemology. Now, do all those words scare you? <laughs> then you didn't take our philosophy, uh, our, uh, our philosophical theology class. Ontology or ontological has to do with this, the nature of being or existence. 
Cosmological has to do with the, how things are caused. Teleological has to do with design. What's the design and what purpose is the design for? Um, and the others we'll get into. We'll, we'll talk about each of those as we go along, but these are good words for you to know. And like ontological, the base word on that is ontology, which is the philosophical consideration of being or existence. Teleological, the basis is teleology, which is the study of design by, for purpose. So we'll get into a little bit of that today. Um, those are great words to throw around at, at cocktail parties, but uh, you, know, you don't have to know the words in order to understand the concepts behind them. But these are, uh, especially the first several, are among the most historic and fundamental logical or philosophical arguments that have been created to, um, to argue for the existence of God. So any questions before I start? I'm just going to jump into these things, and we're going to talk about them. And you're going to get a little fuzzy brained at some point in the next hour and a half or two, all right? Because some of this stuff isn't easy. If it was easy, everybody just go, of course, you know. And yet these are things people have been arguing about. In the case of the first one, the ontological argument, they've been arguing about it for a thousand years, literally. Okay. So, any questions? Any, any, anybody need to throw up? Anybody need to <laughs> Um, again, this is one of the more difficult ones because the, we do get into the philosophy here. <clears throat> but I love it. As, you, as those of you who are in the class, the uh, philosophical theology class, then you know that. First, let's talk about the ontological argument. The ontological argument has existed for since <clears throat> pre-Christian times. I mean, there are ontological arguments that go back to the earliest of the Greek philosophers in terms of trying to understand the nature of any divine being. But the primary formulation that we have and that people relate to was, was formulated by Anselm of Canterbury in 1078. That's 1078. So it is just under a thousand years old. Um, and this is the primary argument. Uh, Anselm of Canterbury wrote about this in his uh, Proslogion, which is one of his primary works. And he started out with a definition of God. He defined God as, and I quote, that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That was his definition of God. That than which nothing greater can be conceived. The greatest thing you can possibly think of is the definition of God. All right? The greatest being you can possibly think of. So, the ontological argument suggests that the very idea of God logically proves that he exists. Now again, remember that ontological means being or existence. So this is a logical argument which claims that the very idea of a god, or, or of the god, logically requires his existence. How can that be, you say? Well, this is the argument. The argument goes like this. Everybody grab your butts, because this, <laughs> this not only is one of the oldest ones, it's also one of the toughest ones to, to wrap your brain around. We start with this because it's usually the one they start with. It's also the one that gets argued against most by philosophers. I'll say that too. First, I can conceive of a greatest conceivable being, or a GCB, as they use for shorthand. Remember, back to, to Anselm's definition of God, that then which nothing greater can be conceived. I can conceive of a greatest possible being. Right? Greatest conceivable being. That's point number one. I can, I can conceive in my mind of there being God. Secondly, what is real and concrete that is outside my mind, what actually exists, not just something I made up, is greater than what exists only in my mind. By definition, being real is greater than being imaginary. Got that? Does that make sense? I'm going to check with you at each stage here because you know you, you need to add these things up in order to get because these are all presented as logical arguments. Third, if the greatest conceivable being, God, exists only in my mind, then it would not be the greatest conceivable being. Because I can conceive of the greatest conceivable being existing in reality and not just in my mind. The very definition of the greatest conceivable being 
requires that it exists in reality, otherwise it wouldn't be the greatest conceivable being. Okay, you just passed out mentally, right? <laughs> I can conceive of God as being the greatest conceivable being, but the fact that I can think of God being the greatest conceivable being is not as great as a God that really exists that I can conceive of. So therefore, by, by defining God as the greatest conceivable being, and the fact that existing in reality is greater than existing only in my mind, then by definition the greatest conceivable being has to exist outside my mind. Therefore, God exists. Cool. Got it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is the ontological argument. And it is one of the oldest. It is one that is always continuing to come up. Anselm proposed this. It was opposed by a fellow, or a different monk, um, during his, same, his life, during Anselm's life, uh, Guanilo of uh, Marmotier, argued against it. Um, Guanilo said, well, I can conceive of the greatest possible island. That doesn't mean that island exists. Well, Anselm responded and said, no, an island, because it's a physical thing, necessarily can't be perfect. And so therefore, doesn't, the only way you can think of the greatest conceivable perfect, you know, meaning the perfect being, is if by definition that is God. It doesn't apply to anything in the physical world. All right? Um, that, that the very definition of the greatest conceivable being is not applicable to anything that is not God. Right? Because, because God is not physical? No, because God is the greatest conceivable being. An island can't be the greatest conceivable being because... By definition, it's got things that will decay, it's got things that will, you know, storms will hit it, things will get broken, etc., etc. The, the only thing that can be conceived as the greatest conceivable something is that which is wholly other. Alright? So that's anything why... Anything beyond physical, right? Well, anything beyond physical, but if you talk about anything beyond physical but the greatest thing beyond physical, how do we define God? So the whole thing is you argue into the existence of a the greatest possible non-physical being, and by definition, that is what we call God. Does it, does it not uh, give more credence as well? Because it's not only you, it says on the mass that um, conceives this? Well, that it is the potential of any human being to conceive of a greatest conceivable being. Yes. It's not just me making it up. Right. Um, exactly. Now, this same idea, while there were people who argued against it from the, from the 11th century, from the time when Anselm really articulated the version we know of, René Descartes, no less, um, I, I think therefore I am, right? René Descartes, whose contribution to mathematics created the Cartesian coordinates, remember ge geometry? <laughs> Cartesian coordinates, named after René Descartes, mathematician, philosopher, etc. Descartes accepted this and came up with his own version of it. Gottfried Leibniz, another philosopher, did the same. Kurt Gödel, in more recent times, the 20th century, Norman Malcolm, and then Alvin Plantinga. All of them have had their own sort of twist on this. All of them, and, and a number of Muslim philosophers as well. Uh, you know, the great, the golden age of Islam, there were a lot of philosophers doing this kind of thinking because they think of there being one supreme God too. Not the Christian God, but the one you know, they, the arguments, they applied it to the belief in Allah. So, there are various people who have rejected this. And some of them might surprise you. Thomas Aquinas, the great scholastic philosopher, uh, theologian, probably the theologian and philosopher of the Catholic Church, um, the great scholastic, he did not agree with this because, and his reason was theological, he said human beings can't really know God's nature and so they can't argue about, you know, logically to the existence of God's nature. Now, it wasn't that, that Thomas Aquinas had problems arguing for the existence of God. In fact, he has what he called his five ways. Aquinas came up with five different arguments, logical, philosophical arguments for the existence of God, which he called the five ways. But he insisted that you have to use all five of them at once, that picking one out of, out of a litter was not, not adequate because they left holes. But if you look at all five of these arguments at once, then it gives you a comprehensive philosophical argument for the existence of God. But he did not think the ontological argument helped. David Hume, the great skeptical Scott, also did not see it holding because he and Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher that came later, 
um, not too much later, because Hume was still the thing being talked about when Kant came along, um, they both felt that the, the fault here is believing that existence is a predicate, meaning existence is a characteristic. Uh, a predicate means that it's a, an aspect of a thing. That existence was a given, and therefore you couldn't argue that argue as though that were an aspect. You don't have to know what that means. But um, so they've gone back and forth and back and forth. There is another version of the ontological argument that argues not from conception but from necessity. That by definition there there is at least one there has to be at least one necessary entity existing, and by definition that necessary entity would be God. I'm not going to break that one down for you because your head will explode. Uh, William, William Lane Craig, whose book you have, he has, he has argued a version of the ontological um, argument for God, and particularly he has, he has drafted it, he and Alvin Plantinga both have drafted it in the form of um, the existence of a necessary being rather than a conceived being, all right? I know you don't understand all of that, <laughs> But understand that for over a thousand years, people have been looking at this argument, and some people have argued with it, but it still continues. And it says the very fact that we can conceive of a being like God existing demands that he exist in reality. You at least get that one. Somebody nod. <laughs> this is the toughest one. But you need to hear about it because it's one of the ones that always, that, you know, that is one of the primary arguments for the existence of God. Any questions about that? Yeah. Chris? When they're having debates about this kind of thing, so, you know, the existence of God, and somebody brings this up with philosophers, do they just accept this? I mean, generally? I mean, I know there's some that don't like you just yeah. explain, but generally speaking today, people just go, oh yeah, this is right. <laughs> Anybody who knows their stuff today would say, well, there's some serious problems with the ontological argument. Now, some people would say, yes, I believe that. The biggest problem they would have is the relationship between conception and existence. The, the, some people would say that Anselm and others who argue this make a jump between the fact that I can conceive of, that it's too big a jump from there to existing in reality. That even if, if conceiving the greatest possible being in my mind is not as great as the great, well, greatest possible being in reality, there still is a leap between conception and existence in reality. That's the place people are arguing. And some people would say, that's not a problem. And some would say, it would. Skeptics, if you tried to quote the ontological argument to them, skeptics would say, oh, no, 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 no. you know, uh, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, you know, Thomas Aquinas, even they, he didn't believe in that. Uh, and yet there is something there, or we stood still in the you know 20, early 21st century wouldn't still be talking about this. Right. William Lane Craig, Alvin Plantinga both have versions of this based upon the necessary being, um, and so it's still it's still alive and kicking, even though some people, human Kant and others, felt like it was dead. It's not. All right. And if you are talking about the apologetic explanation for the existence of God, you, whether you understand all the concepts or not, you at least need to know what that argument is. Right? Okay, let's go on. The next argument, back to Aquinas, this is only one of his, I'm not going to give you all of his five ways, because this would be, you know, all Aquinas all the time, if we were doing that. Um, Aquinas' cosmological argument. The cosmological argument is the argument from causation which suggests that since every effect must have a cause, and there cannot logically be an infinite regression of causes, I'll talk about that, there must be a first cause. And I said, or prime mover, which started everything. Technically speaking, the argument from first cause, that somebody had to, had to be the first cause who created the first effect that created, you know, down the line, that there had to be a domino effect there, because Parmenides, all the way back to Greek Parmenides, he, he established that um, something cannot come from nothing. <coughs> that par, parmen, Parmenidean, hard word, Parmenidean argument has always held to be true. Now, some modern, especially quant, you know, philosophers who look at quantum physics, argue that that may not necessarily be true. We'll get to that. But it has always been held, since the early philosophers of Greece, that something doesn't come from nothing. You know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The fact that that's a question demonstrates the proof of the fact that 
something is not perceived as coming from nothing. Either the chicken or the egg had to come first, and was then the pro you know the thing that produced the, the other. So that's the argument. Uh, and now the prime mover, the first cause is the first the, the first cause that leads to an effect. The prime mover technically would, is slightly different. They're often lumped together. In fact, they're often confused. Prime mover would mean um, all motion is the result of other motion. What was the first motion? So prime mover has to do with particularly movement, and first cause has to do with cause and effect. They are very closely related, and so that's why they're often confused or often you know conflated. Ernest. So with this argument, one has to conclude that there was a cause somewhere. That doesn't mean it was God, that God is not the cause. This is just establishing the fact that there had to be a cause in order to have an effect. Right. So then somewhere in there, God, but that's not God. God is not the cause. Right. Okay. Well, for every effect, there's a cause. Right. And that, in a, that cause was an effect of something, which God mm -hmm. had a cause, mm -hmm. which had a cause, which had a cause. Oh, wait, Where did it start? That's the question. And the argument is like this. There is an order of causes in the world. We accept cause and effect. Even though David Hume argued that you can't be sure of it, you know, there are causes and effects. Everything, everything that you do, there is some effect of it, intentional or otherwise. If I flip a switch, the lights come on. You know, if I throw a hand grenade, something blows up. There is cause and effect in everything. Nothing is outside of the relationship of cause and effect. Got that, Pam? Mm. Okay. <laughs> but you, you got that far, right? Every effect has a cause. And, okay, secondly, nothing can be the cause of itself. Every effect has something else which is the cause of it. And that goes back to Parmenides, all right? Something cannot come from nothing, which means something can't cause itself, nor can it exist without a cause. Third, therefore, everything that is caused must be caused by something else. You with me so far? <laughs> there cannot be an infinite regression of causes. I'm going to come back to that in a second. And therefore, there must be a first uncaused cause, which is the definition of God. There has to be something before which there was nothing else. Something had to start it. Now... Let me go back and talk about an infinite, there cannot be an infinite regression of causes. Here you get into set theory, mathematically. I'm not going to get you into set theory. I'm just going to explain why you can't have an infinite set of actual things, an infinite set of actuals. It's pop, the idea of an infinite set of something, a set is just a collection. Um, we have in mathematics all sorts of infinite sets. You know, the, the set of natural numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's no end in that, right? It's an infinite. But at a certain point, it becomes abstract. All When we're talking about abstract infinite sets, no problem. Okay, there's always, for every x, there's an x plus 1. That's an abstract set. But you cannot have an actual set of infinites. And let, me, let me give you a couple of examples why that's so. And the reason is because if you try to deal with actual sets of infinites, that, that's like an infinite number of days, either in the future or in the past, it reaches an absurdity. If you had an infinite number of blocks, infinite number, half of them were white and half of them were red, and you took away all the white ones, how many red ones would you have left? An infinite number. You took half of them away, how could you have just as many as you had when you started? There's a famous um, story or a, a model um, by Hilbert, which he calls the Grand Hotel. And he says, you've got this hotel with an infinite number of rooms, and every room is full. Every room in this infinite number of rooms in this hotel, the Grand Hotel, is full. And a guest shows up and says, I want a room. What do you say? We got one. I've got a room, because we have an infinite number of rooms, even though they're all full. Do you see why real sets of infinite things reach absurdities so that 
They just simply don't work. You cannot conceive of an infinite number of real things. You can only have infinite sets of abstract things. And so when you say an infinite regression of causes, those are real things because they're points in time. This cause, this effect, which caused this effect, which caused this effect, each one of those occurs in real time, which means if you're talking about an infinite regression of causes, you're talking about an infinite set of real things, and that is not logically possible. Pam? Could you use the word energy instead of causes there? Well, it, that would get you more toward the issue of prime mover. You know, the prime mover pushed something, which pushed something, which pushed something. So energy would fit, although it's a slightly different argu argument than cause and effect. I can kind of almost see energy and understand that more than I can the word cause. Okay. That's right. Uh, think of, and I'm just making this up as I go along, and any analogy breaks down at some point. Think about, think of dominoes. Only there's an infinite number of dominoes. You can watch them falling. And when you're watching all these dominoes, one hits the next, hits the next, hits the next, do you not believe at some point there had to have been a first domino to start this process? That would be the first cause, which affected the next domino, the next domino, the next. And the prime mover would be the one that pushed that first domino. Okay? That's the difference. The first domino would be the first cause because it created the reaction. But the prime mover would be the one that pushed the first domino. So they're related, but, but slightly different. Questions about that? Chris? Does anybody argue against this point? Like, does anybody say there is an infinite regression of causes? No. Well, the, the only people that have argued against an infinite regression of causes are people who have taken some observations from quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics has suggested, it is not proven, that some particles appear and disappear from reality without explanation. Now, those who have responded to it, including William Lane Craig, say, you know, and people say that means these particles appear from nothing and they go to nothing. Um, Craig and others would say, no, we recognize that in the void there is energy. We may not be able to perceive any physical presence, but that energy appears as a particle and then disappears back into energy, into the void. And energy is something. It's not nothing. And so that's where they argue. Some people have argued that there is that, that quantum mechanics gives us the sense that there doesn't have to be a cause for every effect. This thing just shows up without any apparent cause. Right, so that's one thing. Some people have said, and this is very new, a couple of days ago, an article came out where some scientists had just said there may not have been a Big Bang, and that in fact the universe may always have existed, which is what they used to say a long, long time ago. <coughs> Um, they're beginning to come back to that, but but they're arguing, and, and the biggest argument against that. And, and by the way, I saw it. There was a uh, Barbara. You sent me an article that wasn't that. This was from last. The one you sent was from last year, but it was related to that. The interesting thing is the guys who wrote that article from the Institute of Creation Research, which I'm familiar with, they missed the point. When they they were sort of saying, well, this is a good thing. They're saying the Big Bang didn't happen. Well, they fail to realize that if that if the Big Bang didn't happen, that gives credence to the argument that the universe did not have a beginning. And if the universe didn't have a beginning, that's an argument against God, not for it. So the guys at the Institute for Creation Research missed the bigger point there. And they were thinking this is a great thing, that they're suggesting now that the Big Bang theory didn't happen. That's not really a good thing for the argument for the existence of God. You see why that is? Now again, the ancient philosophers, Aristotle for instance, believed that the, that the universe had always existed, did not have a beginning. Well, that, you know, you just, you can say, well, therefore you didn't need a god for the universe to exist. But then you get back to this idea that if the universe has always existed, then every moment in time, in the, in the past of the universe, creates an infinite regression of, of seconds, and therefore an infinite actual set, which is not logically possible. It leads us to absurdities that, as far as any mathematics has ever been able to determine, is not viable. Okay? Now, you need to spend the next 10 years or so thinking about this stuff. Because <laughs> it, it, it... The infinite regression of causes, most people don't even notice that when they come over. They go, well, yeah, something had to, be, had to start it. Well, there are, there are mathematical and philosophical arguments about are there or are there not an infinite uh, regression of causes, but I think the very much the strongest case 
And the case that most philosophers today make is that, no, it's not possible. You quickly reach absurdities that simply don't work. Pam. I was just thinking, if the world had always existed, isn't heaven always existed? And would we possibly be in heaven now? <laughs> no, we're not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, oh, it's interesting, interesting you would say that, um, because the, the issue of at what, you know, if things are infinite, if time is infinite, at what point are we and how do we know is a real philosophical question. And let me give you a way of, of looking at that. If I have a point here and a point here, and I say, I'm going to go halfway from here to there. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose I continue and every step I take is halfway to the destination. Halfway, halfway, halfway. Will I ever get there? No. No. The same kind of thinking applies to the idea of time being infinite. Are we, you know, I'm getting in pretty deep here. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sorry. But the idea of, uh, well, how do we know? We'll never get to a year from now. We'll never get to 10 years from now because every step we take will be halfway getting there. And if time is infinite, if there's not some finite starting point, and we believe, finite in, which is the Christian doctrine, inside which we can define legitimate steps and parameters. If it's always only halfway to getting there, which is what would happen if it was an infinite thing, then we don't know where we are in time. We don't know how to get there. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't know if it's heaven. It gets very nasty if you, if you try to deny the fact that you cannot have an infinite number of real things, like moments in time. But, uh you were saying that this theory about um, uh, Earth always being here would discount God. I immediately thought just the opposite. I thought, oh, this heaven is an infinite that that we're all expecting, and maybe this is it? Yeah, well, we get into perceptions, and I'm hoping that my perception of this place is not quite as good as heaven's <laughs> going to be. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, there, you get in, you, Discussions of this, you can't get into absurdities. Okay. But I want you to understand the basic, even if you don't understand all the premises, you see how this is an argument from the fact that there had to be a first cause or a first prime mover, a first mover. Right? You understand the argument, even though you know the, it, it, it can get pretty hairy when you get into the, particularly when you start having people, philosophers, argue against it in very abstract terms and then responses to that, etc. This too. There are versions of this that uh, William Lane Craig has been involved in. This goes back, Aristotle, even though he did not believe in, in, in the, he believed in an infinite universe, he did have a version of this. Um, the, the early Neoplatonists, early Christianity, um, Islam, from the 9th to the 12th century during the golden age of Islam, they had philosophers arguing the cosmological argument, the, cause, the argument from first cause, um, all of it based on this fundamental belief that um, Something cannot come from nothing, from entities. And that is one of the key things. The only people who've ever really, really tried to argue against that, as I say, are some of the quantum physics people, and there's a counter to that. That, well, it doesn't come from nothing, it comes from energy, which does exist in the void. And most of that stuff we can't really see anyway. Um, okay, any questions about that? Do you see why this is called philosophical apologetics? Uh, but you know what? Your brain will get bigger if you work on this stuff. <laughs> and heavier. <laughs> okay, so ontological argument, cosmological argument. Let's now talk about a special version of the cosmological <laughs> argument called the Kalem cosmological argument. This is a fairly modern, actually it goes back to the golden age of Islam as well. Kalem is um, the expression that is used, ilm al-kalim, is the Arabic um, expression for science of discourse, which is the rational speculative theology that they use in Islam, especially for the existence of God. That's why it's called. And this was a specialty of the Islamic uh, philosophers. And so, and this is the one that William Lane Craig has almost single-handedly um, created a discussion around it. In fact, he has a book called The Kalem Cosmological Argument, a whole book about this. Um, so me giving you one slide 
Don't try not to be too overwhelmed by that. It's a modern reformulation of the cosmological argument, and it has been very important in response, in responding to the new atheists. Uh, all the way Christopher Hitchens and Dawkinses and, you know, these guys that have come along. And in fact, I may change in this course, toward the end, in the last couple of classes, I may actually focus on some of the arguments of new atheists, which are not very good arguments. The new atheists, who a lot of people think are, woo, they're so brilliant, they're really not very bright. And if you really read what they say, and then you read smart commentary about them, you'll realize they simply do not think well. And yet, they talk a lot, and I think they just overwhelm people with that. I may spend some time talking about the new atheists. The argument for the, the Kalem cosmological argument, and this differs in that it goes further than the, than the cosmological argument in identifying what kind of God is, was necessary as the first cause. All right? Um, and this was, you, Barbara, you asked me last week, I think, there was a yes. reference to the Kalem. Well, again, William Lane Craig, it's his book. This is a big deal for him. Uh, first, everything that begins to exist has a cause. There's that, you know, first cause idea. Second, the universe began to exist. We believe there was a start. And most scientists, non-believing scientists, have advocated for the Big Bang, that there was a point in time in, when the, in which the universe began. Of course, they can't tell you, you know, when they, when they say the Big Bang, the universe began by one infinitely dense particle of matter exploding. When you say, well, where did that infinitely dense particle of matter come from? They have no answer. Well, we say, God, put it there. But the universe began to exist. Uh, something cannot come from nothing. Therefore, the universe had a cause. Up to that point, that's kind of the summation of the cosmological argument as a whole. Something had to cause all that is. But the Caleb argument goes on and says, if the universe had a cause, then an uncaused, personal creator of the universe exists, who is beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and enormously powerful. Now think about it. If, if there is a first cause, a first mover, a creator of the universe, the thing that caused the universe to be, and we argue that because of the existence of the universe, then he himself, or itself, however you want to talk about it, she herself could not be, we've said, is not caused. They're the first cause. They're, um, they can't have had a beginning because they're the, they're the first that was. Okay, I mean, they, 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 they couldn't be the first cause if they had to start from somewhere else, if something began them or caused them. They couldn't be uh, changeable because they, you know, they, well, all of these characteristics, change, materialness, being stuck in time, being stuck in space, none of those would fit the very idea of first cause or prime mover. Because those would all be limitations that would not fit in the definition of what the first cause would have to be in order to be the first cause of everything. They themselves, he himself, God himself, would have to be inherently limited in some way. And that's not possible given the very idea of being the first cause of everything that exists. And so therefore, an uncaused personal creator of the universe exists who is beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and enormously powerful. Um, now, let me give you a little bit of background on that. The idea of, um, and this goes back, as I said, to, to the Islamic arguments, significantly, but when we get down to here that the uncaused personal creator of the universe, etc., etc., that by definition is what we call God. And all of this, much of this comes back to well, what is God? The uncaused cause, the prime mover, the, you know, the uncreated creator. Those are all defining terms of what we believe God to be. Um, and and that, that's where we come to this. The 11th century Al-Ghazali philosopher um, was one of the main advocates of this Kalem argument. And it's, it's, there are various versions of it, but the version that uh, Al-Ghazali um, came up with, Ghazali, excuse me, is the one that William Lane Craig has primarily uh, used. How do I want to expand on that? Uh, first, are there any questions about what we've said? Yes? So how, how does this differ 
from saying that the uni universe itself is beginningless and changeless. Uh, yeah. Well, the universe is perceived as inanimate as a whole. I mean, the universe as a whole. And so, therefore, would have no will. In fact, that's where you get the personal creator. It, had to, it would have to be a being that had the, the potential for intentionality to make the decision to create or to move or to cause, rather than it happening in an inanimate being. That's why this argues for a personal being, because whatever that first cause was, whatever that prime mover was, initiated, and therefore implies intentionality, initiated the creation of everything else. It has to be outside the universe. I mean, it's immaterial. Exactly. The universe is material. Changeless, of course, the universe is expanding. Timeless, the universe, of course, means time. And well, spaceless, it is space. And again, something cannot, cannot be the cause of itself. Yeah. If God were in time, if God were material, if God were within a certain space, then he would be in the creation. He would be part of the creation. And since something cannot create itself, by definition, God has to be outside that. Because that's what's created. So it has to be personal because it implies intentionality. It has to be outside time and space and the material world. Because otherwise, time, space, and the material world would have created themselves. Because that would be the definition, you know, God would be part of that. It has to be a being that's outside all the created stuff, or else it would fall under that problem of something having made itself. And it has to, it has to be personal, because it did it intentionally. Stan? Um, are you going to talk about string theory or anything like that? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Partly because most of the people who know string theory really don't understand it. Okay, And, I, and that's not a criticism. Yeah. It's because string theory is... Theory, that's, a, that's a, a primary word there. String theory basically says that all that is exists of a series of quantum strings. And that's one theory for trying to explain how things are. Now, the um, I'll get into the multiverse idea, uh, or the, the many worlds idea in a few minutes when we talk about um, some of the other stuff. Pam? This is more um, where I can understand this more by personally taking this in that my belief has always been there's no beginning and no end to God. So this says in everything right there of what my belief God is. So this one would be the easiest one for me. Well, there's no, no beginning and no end to God, but there is a beginning and an end to the created world, which is why God is not part of the created world. Okay, that's why he doesn't fit inside it. That's why we can say he's uncaused, personal, beginningless, changeless, immaterial, etc. Because he's not within the created universe. If he was, he couldn't have created the universe. Carolyn? The thing that strikes me that's sort of similar to what Pam was saying is that back, what, 34, 500 years ago, God's name, God tells his name to Moses, and it's, I, I am, I exist. Exactly. It's, it's existence. And, and how beautiful is that? Right. That's, that's who God is. He's existence. And that's why we exist is because God exists. Right. And, 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 and you can't, we can't exist without God. It yeah. just, it just, Kind of falls. It, it fits. Like yeah. yeah. Again, that's a good observation. God's proper name, as he gave it to Moses, was I am Yahweh. It means I am the one who is self-existent. I don't, I'm not reliant on anything else for my being. I am the thing that was existed before all else. Yeah. And I'm not contingent, meaning dependent upon anything else for my existence. I am. Simple as that. Well, that's what this is talking about. That God has to be the one that doesn't fit inside any of the created stuff by definition. So you can see how this, the Kalam argument, takes the cosmological argument that there had to be a cause for the universe and that causes God, and it gives it attributes. It takes the next logical step, philosophically logical step, and says, and here's what God has to be like if this, if this is true. Ernest. And that's basically the distinction. That this is now we have attributes of God. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, whether we agree with them or not is not the issue, but this extends and makes it more specific. Exactly. See, up until here, number three, it's the same. that's the cosmological argument. The Caleb argument builds that, and then it adds the fact, okay, what does that tell us about the necessary nature of God? Mm -hmm. And so we end up with a description of a God who is personal, immaterial, changeless, not in space, not in time, etc., etc., which begins to look very much like 
the God that we understand, mm -hmm. our definition of God. Okay? So this is the Kalem argument. Now, um, again, I've got, I've got a bunch of notes here about stuff that will just make it worse. <laughs> 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 all right. Let's talk about the teleological argument. And this is one that you all know, and that makes perfect sense. Um, I should have started with this one I built up. <laughs> the teleological argument is the argument from design, or the watchmaker argument, or watchmaker analogy as it's sometimes called. And it says that the complexity of the world demands belief in a creator in the same way that the complexity of a watch demands belief in a watchmaker. Now, William Paley, 19th century theologian, is the one who is um, best known for this. But again, it's very old. Socrates had some aspect of... Socrates, who believed in one God, although he's not the God we understand, but he didn't believe in the pantheon of, of um, Greek gods. Socrates, his student Plato, and Plato's student Aristotle. Did you know those guys were all linked together? Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were student, teacher students. All three of them argued some version of the design argument. It has always been around. In the Middle Ages, again, Islamic theologians argued this. Christians have argued it even before in England, before William Paley, in the um, early 18th century, the 1700s, we had William Turner, John Ray, and others using this watchmaker analogy. But Paley is the one that articulated in the way most people recognize it. Um, before I get into it, again, David Hume argued against this. Charles Darwin argued against it in terms of the um, natural selection, evolution by natural selection. But it still has maintained a common sense kind of appeal to everyone. And the argument goes like this, very simply. First, a watch, suppose you're walking along and you pick up a watch off the sidewalk. A watch has many complex parts. It works in a specific and intentional toward a, uh, specific and intentional function that keeps time. And it is intelligently designed to achieve that function. Nobody's going to pick up a watch and say, oh, this happened by accident. You know, the forces of the wind and the rain accidentally push together the various elements of metal and, and crystal and whatever to create this timepiece, which keeps absolutely accurate time. Right? Duh? Yeah. Secondly, similarly, the world has many complex parts. In fact, the more we learn about it, the more we realize that the most complex watch in the world doesn't begin to approach the complexity of the, of the, the world we live in. So the world has many complex parts. It works to a specific and intentional function, especially the sustaining of life. Um, and it is intelligently designed to achieve that function. Just like nobody would argue that a watch happened by accident, a reasonable person can draw the analogy to say the created world, which is more complex, cannot have happened by accident. Therefore, there is a very pro high probability that the world, like the watch, was intelligently designed by a creator. The complex world requires a creator just like a complex watch requires a watchmaker. This is the one almost everybody gets right away, right? <coughs> now, there are, I'm going to get into the fine tuning, which is an advanced version of this uh, in a minute. <coughs> we've, got, we've got more advanced versions of the cosmological argument, more advanced versions of the teleological argument. Um, one of the issues that has come out in recent times is uh, there's a term called irreducible complexity. Charles Darwin argued that life as we know it, everything as we know it that is organic, everything living, evolved over time. And human beings evolved from lower species. Well, the a basic principle of evolution by natural selection is that each mutation or adaptation that increased the um, you know, that changed an animal from being a lizard to a bird, for instance, that every mutation that stuck, only stuck, and continued on to the descendants of that being because it provided some inherent advantage. The ones who had better mutations survived, the ones who had worse mutations died out. So by definition in natural selection, it has to be something which every characteristic that gets passed on, every single one, has to show some particular advantage over its previous state of evolution. Got that? The problem is when you look at much of the, the especially biological world, you know, living animals, 
there are aspects of animals today that cannot be, you cannot work backwards in stages and show how each one of those stages in the evolutionary process created an advantage that led you to what you have today. One of the examples that's often given is the human eye. When you look at the optic nerve and the rods and the cones and the complexity of the retina and the capability of two eyes to give you three-dimensional sight and of the iris ability to adjust for uh, light intake, there are the evolutionists say that the human eye started as a light-sensitive freckle. What stages of advantage from a light-sensitive freckle to the complexity of the human eye at each point of evolutionary advance, how, is, how did that gain an advantage so that that continued to develop? Irreducible complexity says that from where we have now, it's not possible to reduce one stage at a time and according to evolution, determine that each of those stages gave an, an evolutionary advantage so that it was continued and moved to the next level. It doesn't fit. Evolutionary, evolutionary biology by natural selection does not explain the complexity that exists. Michael Behe, who is the one a biologist, Christian biologist, who termed, who, who coined the term irreducible complexity, he's looked at some animals like there's a single cell organism called a flagellum, a microorganism single cell, but it's tiny. <laughs> um, the flagellum uses, it has a tail. This, it's called the, the flagellum. Flagellum means a whip. It's got this whip-like appendage that spins, and as it spins, it lives in liquids, in uh, water. And when it spins, it propels it, and it can move around and search for food and all sorts of things. Well, Behe has demonstrated, when you take that apart, that, that the mechanism that allows that flagellum's whip tail to move has every component of a modern electrical engine, a motor. All of the pieces that we have in a motor that create movement, that drives our parts and whatever, that microorganism, the flagellum, has all those pieces. And Behe argues, with a microorganism, what were the stages of development that brought you to something as complicated, as complex and complete as that? What were the advantages of the previous stages? You can't break it down by stages and say that at each stage an, an evolutionary advantage was made. So again, the idea of design, there are aspects of it like irreducible complexity that are argued today as being necessary. I'll give you um, two definitions for this irreducible complexity since I see sort of dazed looks on your faces. Michael Behe, this is his definition. It's uh, irreducible, irreducible <laughs> complexity is a single system which is composed of several interacting parts that contribute to a basic function and where the removal of any one of those parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. Take one piece away, which would be necessary if you were going backwards from that in evolution, and the whole thing falls apart. There is no advantage and so therefore it doesn't fit the definition of evolution by natural selection. William Dembinsky, another intelligent design advocate, defines it this way. A system performing a given basic function is irreducibly complex if it includes a set of well-matched, mutually interacting, non-arbitrarily individuated parts such that each part in the set is indispensable to maintaining the system's basic and therefore original function. The set of these indispensable parts is known as the irreducible core of the system. You can't take any piece of it away without the whole thing being useless, so how did it develop from nothing to that point? by natural selection, since natural selection says every stage has to have an advantage built in. Got that? Those are all aspects of the modern understanding of the teleological argument for design. Yes? What, what's the most, what's a valid, I don't want to say what, what is a contemporary argument against intelligent design against the teleological it would be evolution. Evolution. And, um, and there have been, there was a court case which advocated teaching intelligent design as equal to evolution in schools. Michael B. he was called to testify. And the judge felt like his argument was not convincing. And so he ruled against intelligent design being taught in the classroom in one case. It was a state case, it wasn't a federal case. Um, and so not everybody's convinced by it. Although it seems pretty darn convincing to me. And I've read uh, 
Michael Behe and William Dubinsky both have books. Um, one of the most influential of Behe's books is called Darwin's Black Box. And it's a good read. I'd recommend it to you. Um, but evolution by natural selection is the only argument they really have against and this there's idea. There's so many counters to that. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. I don't think evolution holds. Evolution by natural selection doesn't hold. That doesn't mean. We, nobody denies that there are kinds of evolution that are absolutely real. There is microevolution, where you know birds develop birds that live on that are the same species that live on islands where they have really tough nuts will grow shorter, thicker beaks to break the nuts, and where they live on islands where they're they're, um, they're they need long beaks in order to reach into crevices to grab you know things to eat. They'll develop long beaks. They're the same species, but they develop microadaptations. The problem is when you get into macroevolution, which says that there is entire speciation, meaning whole new species come into existence. Charles Darwin said that um, he expected that the fossil record, and we haven't, been, we haven't been finding fossils for very long. I mean, you know, there, there was very little of that when Darwin was alive. They were just getting started. Darwin said he was absolutely convinced that within a generation or so, we would find an expansive evidence in the fossil record and archaeology, etc., um, to demonstrate the truth of evolution by natural selection. We would find the missing links, to use those words, the things that showed the steps between lizards and birds, for instance, which is one of the progressions that were supposedly going to happen, that we would find, conclusively, we would find uh, fossil evidence to show the connection between human beings and lower primates. We have never found those. There's only one fossil which has existed almost since, since Darwin's time, which has even been suggested to indicate speciation between lizards and birds, specifically. And it is widely considered that it's likely it was a hoax, because the guy who found it made a lot of money off of it, and various other reasons. There's no other evidence that we have that speciation, macroevolution, occurs, ever. Yes? You've read a lot about this, so I'm going to just it, you give me the short answer. Is there a, a reason, is there somebody who argues for the advantage of life? I mean, what, what advantage is there to being alive? You don't last very long compared to like, I don't know, a diamond or something. Um, so, so why did life start if it's so advantageous? I don't know who addresses that specifically. I mean, there are... There are a lot of philosophical arguments, including some arguments related to this, start with the question, why is it like this and not some other way? Yeah. Why is anything, why does anything exist yeah. as opposed to not existing? And you go, well, duh, that's actually one of the most fundamental and important philosophical questions. In fact, it's one of the ones that gets us into some of these things. But evol not, evolution doesn't explain life very no. well, I don't think. It just says, like, well, evolution says it's an accident. Yeah. It just happened. Kind of an electrical... You know? Thing or something. Like, you know, it, it weeds, it weeds like, happen, you know, the life happened, yeah. and, and it just shows up, you can't, you know. Couldn't um, stop it. But <laughs> is there not something inherent in people that says, I don't think so, that life, you know, the existence of life, especially human life, is just a chance occurrence, that, which means there is no value to it? Yeah. And the existence of a weed? In fact, it, it doesn't seem that valuable. I mean, yeah, you can move, um, you can... You can reproduce. Right. But Well, from an objective point of view, it doesn't. But from a subjective point of view, almost <laughs> well, any yeah. human being you've ever <laughs> met that's like, not a sociopath would say, yeah, it's better, you know, people are better than that. Yeah. There's something about human beings that make them more than just a weed, you know, an accident of uh, or a biology. Rock. A rock. Or that's a rock. What I'm thinking. Or a tree. I mean, you know, Carolyn had a friend who went through a pretty radical, weird stage. In which she said you know, she so valued the you know, other biological life, like trees, that if she came to the point of, uh, if she's driving and she had to veer off the road, and if it was hit a tree and survive, or and kill the tree, or not hit the tree and, and die herself, she wasn't sure. But what it wouldn't be better if she just allowed herself to die rather than kill a tree. And I'm going, no, <laughs> nobody with their head screwed on straight would say that, <laughs> right? Am I right? And yet. What does it mean that we believe that's true? Yeah. And it's not just for me, it's for, I would say that for other people too. There is some perceived, subjectively perceived, but perceived inherent value in human life that keeps us from thinking that this is just one more accident exactly. of biology. 
getting into a, a, a different philosophical argument here. Let's take a break. Again, we talked about the cosmological argument and how the Caleb is a refining or reformulating of that. In addition to the teleological argument of design, that Paley is the, is the most, uh, is the best known of the people who articulated that, we have what's called the fine tuning, which is a version of the teleological argument. And some of the stuff, some of you have heard before, if you were in our philosophical theology class, the fine tuning argument, I actually preached a sermon, it was one of the first sermons in the current series I'm doing called Why We Believe, where I talked about the existence of God, and I talked about both the teleological and the fine tuning teleological argument. The fine tuning argument is a version of the teleological argument that is based on scientific discoveries of cosmic constants which have existed since the Big Bang. If the values of the cosmic constants were even very slightly different, life on Earth would not be possible. Okay, now, let me explain that to you a little bit. I'll give you an analogy. This is one I used in the sermon. Suppose you were on a mission to Mars, and you landed on Mars, and as you're traveling around completely inhospitable, can't breathe the oxygen, you know, too hot in the sun, too cold in the shade, everything about it is completely against human life. As you're walking along, you and your group come upon a domed structure. <clears throat> and it is sealed. You manage to get inside, and inside the temperature is right at 70 degrees is constant. That the humidity is about 50%. There is an oxygen recycling system, so the oxygen is, or the air you can breathe is perfectly acceptable to humans. There is a way of capturing energy so that it has power. Um, it has a, it's a system for growing its own food. Everything about it creates a biosphere that can support and sustain human life. Now, if you found that on Mars in a completely otherwise inhospitable environment, would your natural inclination be to think that that happened by accident or that somebody before you got there did that on purpose? That is the fine-tuning argument. Now, in 1960s, early 1960s, the same year that Time Magazine did the famous article, uh, cover article, Is God Dead, um, was when there were several different astronomers at that time, but particularly, um, oh, I just lost his name. Carl, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan. When Carl said, thank you. <laughs> when Carl Sagan made the announcement that there are only two things necessary from a, you know, an astrological or astronomical rather, point of view to sustain human life. It has to be a planet that is a certain distance from the sun. Um, and the other one, I'm, I'm telling you this stuff off the top of my head. And the, the second one was water. the availability of water. I think that was it. There was, those, if you had those two things, you were good. Three things. There has to be a sun. Well, the, the sun, and you have to be a certain distance from a certain kind of sun. You know, so the distance from the sun and the availability of water. So those two things were all that was necessary. Because of that, that launched this idea that given how many stars there are out there, there should have been a septillion different possible planets in the universe that could sustain human life. Because there were only those two criteria. Well, over that launched the whole SETI movement, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, those giant dishes listening for some indication. We launched satellites off into deep space with these engraved metal plates to try to communicate with the, the inevitable intelligent life we find out there. Well, since that time, Carl Sagan's two necessary requirements for human life became five, became ten, became twenty, now there are just over 200 accepted necessary criteria for human life to exist on this or any planet. Because we now are talking about 200 and not two, there are, it's now estimated that the likelihood of another planet being able to have all 200 plus of those requirements in order to sustain human life is virtually nil. Not only is there not a septillion planets, the likelihood that there are any planets is highly questioned now. All right, having said that, those 200 plus necessary requirements for human life are the focus of the fine tuning argument. How did all of those things become exactly to a very minor, a very tiny scale of difference 
become exactly what was necessary for life to exist. A couple of examples. The rate of expansion of the universe, given the Big Bang Theory, which the accepted theory of uh, you know, astronomers, cosmologists, etc. If the Big Bang Theory, when it happened, if the universe had expanded at a rate that was only 10, 1 to the 10, 1 tenth to the 60th power, that is 1 over 10, with 60 zeros after it, if it had expanded either faster or slower than that, then it either would have expanded too fast for stars and planets, etc., to have developed, or it would have caved in on itself. 1 over 10 with 60 zeros after it. That's a very small number. If it had varied that much, plus or minus, the universe could not have been created. The, there are several of the basic cosmic forces in the world. Gravity, the strong and weak uh, nuclear forces, and the electromagnetic force are the four primary ones. Those were all developed within a millisecond of the Big Bang occurring. If the strong nuclear force, that is the force that binds protons and neutrons together, had been just 5% stronger or weaker than it is, life could not have existed. If the force of gravity had been stronger or weaker by 1 over 10 to the 40th power, that's 1 over 10 with 40 zeros, then the stars which could support life, like our sun, would not have been formed. If others, if the neutron were not 1.001 times, that is 1 1,000th more, than the mass of a proton, then protons would have decayed into neutrons, and neutrons would have decayed into protons, and life would not be possible. That's a very tiny difference, and yet that, that difference is necessary. If the electromagnetic force, we're talking about gravity, the strong nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, one of the other, uh, the basic forces, if it had been just slightly stronger or weaker, then life would, be, would have been impossible. And on and on and on. Even skeptical scientists have recognized that the odds of this happening are way beyond anything that we have a right to expect. Fred Hoyle, Sir Fred Hoyle, the man who first who first coined the term Big Bang, he said this, I do not believe that any scientist who examined the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics have been deliberately designed with regard to the consequences they produce inside stars. If this is so, then my, apparent random, my apparently random quirks have become part of a deep laid scheme. He talked about these, there are random quirks in them. If not, then we are back again to a monstrous sequence of accidents. Fred Hoyle later said that, um, and you know, he's not long ago, he said, if the likelihood of all these things happening just the way they did would be statistically comparable to a tornado blowing through a junkyard and leaving in its wake a fully formed and operational 747 jet. Someone else has said statistical likelihood of all this happening just the way it did would be like flipping a coin and getting heads 10 quintillion times in a row. It is not statistically feasible, and yet it is so. Um, this is a version of the design argument which looks at all of the modern findings of science. Now, the only real argument that anybody has ever come up with as a possibility for this that I'm aware of, I mean, they argue all sorts of things, but um, Again, coming out of quantum physics, and the thing about quantum physics is they have observed things, but they don't really know anything. It's, that's why it's all theory. Um, and I'm, that's not a criticism. I mean, they're doing great things, and I'm excited about it. I mean, I like the Big Bang Theory on TV and everything, too. Because you know, he's dealing with string theory or dark matter or various other parts of quantum physics. But um, the, because of the fact that they have apparently perceived that particles come into existence and then go out of existence, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is that with any given subatomic particle, you can either see where it is, but not where it's going, or you can see where it's going, but you don't know where it is. That's the uncertainty part. And that the very act of observing it affects it. There's all kinds of stuff in that, all right? Just if anybody who knows any quantum mechanics, you know, now know that I know a little bit about it. But the thing that they've come up with to try to explain, both to explain the idea that the world is so unbelievably 
fine-tuned for the existence of life, and also to explain some of the other very weird little phenomena that they find in quantum mechanics that they can't explain, they have come up with the idea of the mini-world or multiverse explanation, and that is that there are many universes, <coughs> sort of dimensional versions of what we have, that there are many, many worlds. We just happen to live on the one where all of this stuff worked out that way. But people who, you know, there aren't people because that didn't all work out there. But in any one of those other infinite number of universes or worlds, all of those things wouldn't be. They, have, they haven't worked out that way in all those other multiple universes, all those many worlds. And so therefore, there are people there because it didn't work out for, to their benefit. Great science fiction, but there you need to understand there is no evidence of any kind for that. It is a theory which somebody woke up, you know, from a I don't know, drug and through stream. I don't know where the hell they got it. But they woke up one morning and they had this idea, well, what if there are a lot of different worlds, a lot of different dimensions, a lot of different you know, as far as I know, it may have started, because that's a you know, that's been an idea in science fiction for a bazillion years that there are multiple dimensional universes, etc. Somebody decided if that were true, it would explain how we happen to be in one where all this stuff is lined up. But there's no evidence for that. There is no physical evidence. There's nothing other than somebody having come up with that as an idea. That would indicate there are other beings on other planets. They may not be like us, but... Well, it's, that's possible, exists. although, you know, it, it might be that there is some other, you know, like... We're carbon-based life forms. Maybe there's a silicon-based life, life form that lives in some other dimension or some other world, but the likelihood is that most of those multiverse worlds uh, wouldn't have any life in them because they would not have the things that are necessary for life. Now, it feels like people grab these ideas because they don't want to believe what is logical. Uh, well, yeah, or what makes sense or what there is evidence for. I would absolutely agree with that. And I think that People say, well, why are people like that? Sure. I think we are fallen creatures. Not only are we fallen creatures, and our reason is not what it should be, but there is actually a force in the universe that is actively opposed and working to keep us from accepting that God is responsible for this, and that's not an accident. Okay? I'm getting off philosophy there a little bit, though, if you understand. So this fine-tuning is one of the ones that is hardest for anybody to respond to. Even the skeptics. Um, have to recognize that there's something going on here. Paul Davies, whose early writings especially were particularly not friendly toward any kind of theism, any kind of belief in God, he wrote, with regard to the basic, all the structural fine-tuning in the universe, that the impression of design is overwhelming. And he's not a believer. Any of them that are honest, even if they're not people of faith, have to say, you know, it sure looks like something weird's going on. But they will not allow themselves to take that next step of saying this looks like it was on purpose. All right? Questions about that? Comments? Well, it seems to me as we read and try to study this that it would almost take more faith to believe in some of their arguments than it does to believe in um, design. Absolutely. Uh, Norman Geisler, one of the top apologists, has been for many years, has written a lot of books on it. I, I, in fact, when I ordered these new books for the, the Ready Defense, I ordered two books by Norman Geisler, and one of them is the big book of apologetics. It's like a dictionary of every apologetic topic you can think of. It's a great big thing. Um, Geisler has been doing this for a long time. One of his popular books is called, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. <laughs> and it's true. The requirement that you make so many leaps, either between things or over things, <laughs> in order to be able to say, I don't believe in God of any kind, is extraordinary. Um, all right, now, these are some, we're going to pick up some other arguments next week when we talk about existence of God too. The return to the existence of God. Uh, but I wanted to show you, Peter Kreeft is a Catholic theologian and philosopher, but an evangelical Catholic. Okay. Um, he, in his website, and in some of his books also, he lists 20 arguments for the existence of God. And I don't think even this is an exhaustive list. The argument from change, from efficient causality, which is the cosmological argument, the first cause, 
from time and contingency, from degrees of perfection, the teleological or design argument we've talked about, the Kalem cosmological argument, the argument from contingency, from the world as an interacting whole, from miracles, from consciousness, from truth, from the origin of the idea of God, which is the ontological argument. Um, it's a version of the ontological argument. Then the ontological argument, the moral argument, the argument from conscience, from desire, from aesthetic experience, from religious experience, common consent uh, assignment or argument, and then Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager is not, is not a proof for the existence of God, but it is a it, it's a defense of the reasonableness of faith in God, not of God itself, but in faith in God. Pascal's wager very simply says, and, and if you don't know Blaise Pascal, shame on you. Pascal has at least four major theorems or, uh, that are named after him. He died in his early 30s. He was a mathematician. He created the laws of probability that we still use today. He was a, a philosopher. He was a theologian. Um, and Pascal, since he invented the, or created the laws of probability for a friend who was a gambler and wanted to find out, you know, what, what are the odds of me getting it if I'm drawing to an inside flush, you know, or inside straight, excuse me. Um, and so Pascal just was fascinated by that, and he came up with the laws of probability on a weekend. Um, <laughs> he said that Pascal's wager is, suppose that you decide not to believe in God. Well, if you're right, then you don't gain anything. You just have a life that doesn't have any particular meaning. And if you're wrong, you may suffer the, the damnation of hell for eternity. But assume for a minute that you do believe in God. Then if you're wrong, then the very worst thing that happens is you find some meaning in your life and some focus for the years you have. And if you're right, you have the blessing of eternal bliss in heaven with God. So if you choose against God, there is no upside. If you choose for God, there is no downside. <laughs> this is Pascal's wager, and it just is common sense. And it has been very influential. Again, it's not an argument in favor of God, but it's an argument in favor of belief in God. Florette. But then the person would have to give up self-control. Mm -hmm. mm. and, and they don't want to they, they don't want to have anybody else but themselves as the, the controlling person. Yeah, I wouldn't say so much self-control, because we believe God's in control anyway. They would have to give up the illusion of self-determination. Okay. Um, the difference being that I don't think any of us is really in control. Right. Can you control when you're going to die, you know, when your water heater is going to go out? None of us is really in control. <laughs> but we like to think that we are in charge, that we can make decisions for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most, the most astute among us would know that even self-determination is actually an illusion. There's, you can only be self-determining so far. You're right. People, that's the big objection people have, why they don't want to do that. But, you know, the Christian answer to that would be, you give up the illusion of self-determination and you find security. Right? Because it's not up to you, ultimately. There is a great release that occurs. Um, okay, so these are all arguments that you can look at. We'll look at a few more next week. Um, I'm actually going to skip over this next one, which is the Reformed Epistemology, because I want to deal with that next week. Let's talk about probably the biggest one. And that is the problem of evil and suffering as a demonstration that God does not exist. And again, we look at these all as logical arguments. And here are the premises. The premise for the existence of God says, God is omniscient. He knows all things that are logically possible to know. Second, God is omnipotent. He is able to do anything that is logically possible to do. When we say logically possible, the old sort of, you know, Sunday school question, if God can do anything, can God lift a rock that God can make, can God make a rock so big God can't lift it? Well, that's an illogical question. And the only real answer to that question is, yes, God could create a rock so big that he could lift it, and then God could lift it. <laughs> that's why it's not a logical question. Um, and then third, God is omnibenevolent. He desires to do every good thing that can possibly be done. Those are three fundamental beliefs in the Christian idea of God. That God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent. He knows everything, he can do everything, and he wishes good, all within what is logically possible. Now, that takes us to these premises. If God is omniscient, then he is fully aware of all the pain and suffering that occurs in the world. He's not oblivious to all the suffering. 
Second, if God is omnipotent, then he is able to prevent the pain and suffering, because he can do anything. Third, if God is omnibenevolent, he would want to prevent all the pain and suffering in the world. So these are three ideas that we draw from the belief of the nature of God. And so therefore, we see that pain and suffering still continue. Therefore, it is argued, God is either not all-knowing, or not all-powerful, or not all-good, or else he does not exist. You see why we're looking at this in terms of the existence of God. Because usually that would say God can't exist, or else this would not be. God as we understand him does, cannot exist, or else this would not be the circumstances. All right? So the real issue, people are not taking exception to the first three parts, the first three premises, but this, the fourth, fifth, and sixth premises is... Given the first three premises, one of these things would, would be wrong, right? Um, that he either isn't fully aware, he isn't able to prevent, or he isn't, um, he doesn't desire to prevent. So he's not all-knowing, he's not all-powerful, he's not all-good, or he doesn't exist, all right? Now, let's talk about that for a second. And the reason this is especially important is because there is no argument that is more often made against God, belief in God, acceptance of God than the existence of evil in the world and suffering. But there are some fundamental flaws in this perception. We'll give you God is all-knowing for a second. If God, because people usually have trouble not that God knows there's suffering in the world, we all know there's suffering in the world, but rather, could he do something about it? And is he good? You know, He either can't fix it, though he wants to, or he doesn't want to. Those are the two that people have trouble with. So the second one, if God is omnipotent, he is able to prevent all pain and suffering. A couple of points. Yes, that's true, and God has shown his awareness and his compassion by sharing in our humanity and suffering through Jesus, especially. The very Son of God came to share, and he, he suffered and was tempted in all ways, even as we are yet without sin. He has also demonstrated, that's the biggest way, that he died on the cross, he experienced all of our suffering. So that Hebrews says we do not have a great high priest who is unaware of what we're going through, but rather one who, has, like us, has been through everything we've been through and became just like us in order for that to happen. Second, and in addition to that, God has shown his concern by lessening the, uh, or by limiting the suffering that he allows. Good example of that is Job. God tells Satan how far he can go. I'm a strong believer that the discovery of medication to cure diseases and to, to, to relieve pain, I believe that that's a demonstration of God's hand, that he has helped us in those ways. It's also true that God lessens the suffering by providing healing and comfort, especially by the presence of his Holy Spirit. We believe Jesus healed from terrible diseases. I believe there is healing that happens today. There's a wonderful... Um, you know, in the Psalms, when it says that they will rise up on wings like eagles, they will run and not be weary, they will walk and not faint. I heard a wonderful sermon on that passage one time that said those are the three ways in which God demonstrates his mercy to us in our suffering. They will rise up on wings like eagles are the miraculous healings that God gives. And he can heal immediately. And sometimes he does. <clears throat> They will run and not be weary is an example of the fact that God gives medical treatment. He gives cures to diseases through medicine and through other, where, you know, God allows us to be relieved from the diseases and from the things that affect us. And we, they will walk and do not faint is saying that even if we, like Apostle Paul was, so many have been, if they suffer from diseases for which there is neither a, medical, a miracle cure nor a medical cure, God will sustain us. He will be with us. You know, His grace is sufficient for us, as Paul said. That He will walk with us so that we will not faint. To me, that's a beautiful analogy of how God works in terms of interacting with the human condition to deal with suffering and pain that exists. Um, so that's part of it, is we need to recognize that, that God is has been more active in preventing pain and suffering than most of us give him credit for. 
And then, evil and suffering exist as a direct result of the misuse of human will. We want to blame God for it. But it happens because God created a world in which we have free choice. And we chose against God, and in doing so, sin and evil and suffering was allowed into the world. God did not create evil, but he created a world in which it was possible in order to have a world in which we had free will. Now, we could say, well, we want God to take away all the, all the suffering and pain in, in the world. Well, for him to do that, one of the things he would have to do is remove, by fiat, our human will and freedom. Because, let's face it, mo much, if not most, of the suffering that exists in the world is our decision. We do it to ourselves. We do it to other people. We create circumstances in which the suffering occurs. We make those bad choices. And so if we think God wants to remove all the suffering and pain in the world, then he would have to remove our ability to make those bad choices. And I don't think we can even conceive of what that would mean if he were to remove our ability to make choices, including bad ones. Florette. But he also gave the Israelites the ability to know how to follow him so that uh, he can bless them. Right. So it's up to us to follow his word to, to exactly. achieve those things. He, you're exactly right. He gives us the will to be able to say, are we going to follow God? Or are we going to follow our own appetites or Satan or bad influences? Am I going to take? Am I going to make a decision to to do actions in my life that will heal and that will be a benefit to others, or am I going to take action? Decide to take action that will harm and hurt and create suffering and create pain. God gives us those choices, and He gives us very clear instruction. That's why we have that big thick book we call the Bible. He gives us very clear instruction as to how we are to follow Him, to find peace and to find security. And yet, how many people follow that book? And so, again, if we want God to remove all the pain and suffering, think of the consequences. What would be required if he did that? There was a, I don't remember the name of it, and this just popped into my head, there was an X-Files one time. Remember X-Files? Yeah. By the way, it's coming back. You hear that? <laughs> They're probably going to do at least one season of the reprise of X-Files. Uh, there was one of them I remember, and what it amounted to is there was a genie. And uh, David Duchovny's character, Mulder, he saves the genie. And so she gives him three wishes. And, you know, I, I don't remember all of it, but I remember one of his wishes. He said, well, I want there to be peace on earth. And he walks outside the restaurant, and he walks down the street, and there are all these empty cars. And he walks around, and there, there are no more people. <laughs> God has given, you know, the, whatever power it is that the genie was accessing, gave peace on earth, but he had no concept. And, and all, you know, the, the, the two wishes, the, the first two wishes he had, both of them were like that. You know, peace on earth meant there were no human beings. That's the only way you're going to get peace. <laughs> and then the other one I don't remember, but the third one, he wished for her to be released from the, you know, from the burden of having to do this. And so she was, she no longer had to be a genie, which was smart of him. But the idea is, in the same way, just like that, that X-Files episode, if we say we want God to remove all pain and suffering, are we prepared to accept the consequences of what that would mean in terms of human will, free will, our freedom? Talk about self-determination. Yes. I think it really gets back to our thinking about vision. Uh, you know, our vision as humanity is only so far back and so far forward and so far around. We can't see the whole of anything. Right. I can see the whole of this, but that's about it. You know, I can't see the whole. I bet you can't see the whole of that. There are things happening at a molecular level there that you're not aware of. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You tell me about it, I can believe it not believe it. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly the point. God's vision, because he was the creator, right. is uh, unlimited. Yeah, and we're going to get to that. And That's so the the power of, of vision, just just that image. That we can't see clearly or far. Rich? Exactly. Yeah, I think Satan has a lot to do with pain and suffering. You know, in insurance, they say, well, it's an act of God, so everybody blames God. But a lot of times those things happen as a result of Satan being here on earth. Right. And of course, people who would, you know, would say that God doesn't exist or else there wouldn't be suffering, they don't give, they don't give much credence to the idea of there being an active, you know, malevolent creature this, who is Satan, who is at work in the world. Uh, they still blame God for it, even if they believe it. Okay. 
Well, let's look at another part. The third step. If God was omnibenevolent, he would want to prevent all pain and suffering. There is an assumption in that that is a, cr a critical error. We would be more accurate if we said that God's benevolence means he desires the greatest good, which may not be the immediate relief of suffering. Pain often directs people back to God. People often grow best through suffering. And again, much of what it means to be freely human seems almost to require the existence of suffering. If we take away all suffering, we take away a lot of what it means to be humanity. Because we would take away our free will. There wouldn't be any people in the world if we had, in order to have real peace. We simply may not see far enough or clearly enough to understand what God is doing. So, it's the idea of God being all benevolent does not mean that he necessarily would remove all suffering and evil. It means he would do what was the greatest good. And that may not include taking away suffering and pain. Right? Make sense? Suffering and pain lead to revelations. You know, C.S. Lewis said, um, most notably in the movie Shadowlands, that pain is the megaphone that God often has to use to get our attention before we will listen to the other things he has to say. Most of the great saints in the history of the church have suffered in one way or another, um, from the Apostle Paul on down. Secondly, the idea of God being omnibenevolent and therefore preventing all pain and suffering assumes that physical suffering is the greatest evil and that stopping it is the greatest good, both of which are wrong as far as absolute conclusions. The greatest evil is not suffering. It is the rejection, the human rejection of God and his love. And the greatest good is our returning to him to love and serve him. Therefore, if suffering or pain causes us to turn away from our own sinfulness, which is the greatest evil, and return to relationship with God, which is the greatest good, there is an example how pain and suffering could actually lead to a greater good than what most people assume would be that God takes away suffering. Make sense? Grace? My father used to say, often God allows us to be put flat on our back so that we look up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Flat on our back so that we look up. Very true. And we need to recognize, too, that our human lives are only a breath in God's eternity, that God eventually will make all things right in a heaven free from suffering, and perhaps even, as C.S. Lewis suggests, God will, at that point, work retroactively back through history, which he has the power to do, to turn all past suffering into glory. Mm -hmm. The suffering that we suffer now may actually only be an illusion that God will heal and make glory at some point. That his healing will not only be for us from the point we are in his presence in heaven forward for eternity, but he may actually provide healing backwards through eternity so that suffering and pain did not exist. Very powerful idea. And yet very consistent with what we believe to be the nature of God and very much within the power that we understand he has. Can you expand on that? Well, it's I'm simply... Back, it going back. Well, it's simply saying that we assume, because of our limitations, that the only change that can occur is from where I am, either right now or sometime in the future. God does not limit, is not limited in that way. I'll give you a practical example. I had a good friend of mine who was going to take an exam to get into graduate school. It was, uh, I was just graduated from college. I was part of Christian fellowship then. And this friend was going to take this test. And it was very important for her future. It was on a Saturday. And I said, I will be praying for you. Well, I got really busy. Um, the test was going to be in the morning. And there, then it was in Lexington, and then she was going to drive back and get back to where, our town, Berea, mid-afternoon. Well, about 1 o'clock, I bump into a mutual friend on campus, and she says, yeah, I've been praying for, you know, for Lynn, and she's taking that test. And I went, oh, I forgot to pray for her. I promised I would. And my friend very wisely said, well, you can pray for her now, because God is not limited by time. You pray now, and God could manifest, could respond and answer your prayer three hours ago. All right? Um, God is not limited by time in the same way we are. In fact, I could use you, give you a quantum mechanics example of Schrodinger's cat. 
you know, there's a cat in a box and there's a, if there's a radioactive particle in there and the cat could be dead or could not be dead, dead. and quantum mechanics says, in effect, because of that, the, the cat could be both dead and not dead at the same time. Never mind that. <laughs> Schrodinger's cat, anyway. They look it up sometimes, it's fascinating. Uh, but, so did she pass the test? Um, well, uh, yes, she did. So the point is, when we get to heaven, and we are before the Lord, and all of our physical infirmities are healed, and it says there will be no more crying, or grieving, or mourning, or pain, and God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, we expect that will happen there, and then that will be the state we live in at all time from that point on, into eternity, right? Well, Lewis suggests that given the fact that God is not limited by time, God at that instant could also provide healing from all pain and suffering retroactively back through time. And that all of the Christians that have suffered all of the torment and all of the anguish and all of the torture and all of the persecution, that all of that pain would become glory for them in God's good grace. Because God is not limited in answering prayers just now or in the future. God can answer prayers. God can act in mercy in the past as well. I don't have a biblical reference for that, but I think it's consistent with, with the nature of God and with, you know, God's abilities. Chris first and then Florida again. Do you happen to know where Lewis... I have to look it up. I've read... I, this is one of those things that I, I, think I've, I think I've read all of Lewis's stuff sometime or another. It's been over years. But I've heard this quoted several times, and so I need to go back and find it at some point. It's most likely in miracles, but I don't know that for a fact. Or in the problem of pain. Those would be the most likely places. <laughs> Yes. Would an analogy be when we um, accept Christ and we are forgiven of all of our sins? All of our sins of the past, yeah. So right. that would be something... Comparable. Okay. And, and Lewis's suggestion, which I think very possibly could be true, again, and I don't have a Bible verse to quote, but it's consistent with God's nature and His power, is that God will heal all of the pain and suffering of the past as well. Now the scripture verse talks about past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... So this is why, you know, when people say, well, I don't believe in God because any God that's worth being God wouldn't allow suffering. My first reaction when I hear that is, well, that's an awfully prideful thing to say. That you sit in judgment on God, that you understand everything about suffering and why suffering exists. And, you know, I don't say that because <laughs> that's not a good way to help people understand where they come from. But in fact, these are statements about our need to have some humility when confronted with the reality of suffering and pain in the world, that we don't understand it all. We can't see far enough, we can't see clearly enough, we don't know what God is doing. We make assumptions about what God ought to do if he were what we think God ought to do, you know, based on what we think God ought to do, but maybe God is bigger than our ability to conceive of what he really should be doing. And nor are we able to really understand the ramifications if he were to really take away all pain and suffering. Because inherent in that, he would have to take away all human will. And all of a sudden, peace would be achieved by not having anybody on the planet anymore. Uh, we don't know. So it's a much bigger issue than most people think. And it certainly is not an argument for the non-existence of God. This is going to be one of the sermons I've preached in the series in a few weeks. So come listen. We'll see what else I've got. Any other questions or comments about this? Yes? I have a question in general about what we've been talking about today. Um, of the theories that exist, which is the least um, contested or the most uh, viably used to prove the existence of God? Yeah, to provide evidence for it. Again, we can't <laughs> prove it. Right, right. Um, yes, it depends upon what circles you run in. Because the fact that some of these are philosophically much more demanding then they would be the ones that are more focused on by people who are in philosophy. The ones that are more um, naturally logical, that everybody, the watchmaker argument. If you tell somebody, if you pick up a watch and it's running and it's keeping time, doesn't it make sense there had to be somebody who made that watch? Well, the world is more complex than a watch, doesn't it make sense that, you know, then that's, that's probably the teleological, Paley's teleological argument, is the one that is most naturally used when you're talking to lay people. Because that's the one that makes sense. Well, of course, there's a watchmaker if you have a watch. Well, the world is more complex than a watch, so doesn't that demand somebody who made it? Um, and so, and it really varies, you know, depending upon what disciplines they come from, what level of 
intellectual involvement they had. The Kalem cosmological argument, um, it, it, because it involves some fairly complex di you know, discussions about how we can determine the nature of a creator being from the cosmological argument, um, is, is one of the more popular ones amongst philosophical circles now. Ontology, the ontological argument, um, it'll sort of flare up because somebody will think about it and write something with a given a different an angle and then it'll die down again because there's a lot of opposition to it and perhaps some legitimate opposition to it. That I, I think there is some merit to the argument that you that you it's too big a leap from conception to existence. Okay, um, I'm not ready to throw it out and it is one of the ones they still talk about so we have to talk about it. But that's not one, if I really was serious about trying to convince a, a thinking person, that's the one I know that they would probably smack back hardest at. And so I tend, for thinking people, I tend to focus more on the fine tuning, uh, or, you know, or the cosmological argument, first cause, or the design. I mean, any of those are viable, and any of them, I think, can be fairly readily understood. You know, everything had to, the cosmological argument, everything had to start somewhere. And even scientists today say it started with the Big Bang. Okay, although they don't know how, how the stuff came about that banged. Um, and yet, I think people can sort of get that idea. Okay, well, yeah, if, if the universe had to start somewhere, then what started it? What, what happened right before that stuff blew up in the Big Bang? There's no answer for that. And so the very absence of a, of a scientific answer for that implies a theological answer. And so, yeah, so it, have, it depends entirely on who you're talking to. I think if you're talking about a lay audience, the argument from design, the teleological argument, is the one that you most often and most readily make sense to people. This didn't all happen by accident any more than a watch happened by accident. Okay, other questions or comments? You've been really good. I was afraid half of you would be gone when we came back. <laughs> Thank you. Next week we're going to talk about the moral argument, which is in C.S. Lewis's book, by the way, Mere Christianity. I hope you guys are enjoying Mere Christianity, the most important Christian book of the 20th century. And uh, we'll get into some more of that next week. <laughs>